So again, trauma can happen in neurology. You can lose sensation. You can lose motion. Hemiplegia refers to paralysis of half of the body, so the right side or the left side. Paraplegia means um, paralysis of the legs. And quadriplegia, just like quad, refers to all four limbs, so both arms and both legs, they would be paralyzed. Encephalopathy is just really any disorder of the brain. Um, so this may alter brain function, some problem with brain structure, and there's a lot of reasons this may happen. There are some common orthopedic disorders that you may see. Number one is arthritis. And of course, most of us know what arthritis is. Um, that's just, you know, our joints kind of getting a little bit old. Our best treatment here is actually Tylenol, aspirin, Okay, some over-the-counter medication, and movement. Okay, so being more active actually helps um, the fluid inside the joints to make sure arthritis better. Carpal tunnel syndrome um, is that problem with your wrist where the nerves get compressed inside the wrist and create tingling in the hand. Uh, this is often very painful. There are some surgeries that can be done, um, but generally your best bet is to prevent this in the first place. So use all those lovely little wrist pads that they provide you uh, when, if you type all day. A dislocation is just where two bones are no longer together. We've talked about this once before. A sprain is where we pull a uh, tendon. And a fracture, of course, we've seen once before um, where you actually break a bone. An osteoporosis. Okay, osteoporosis refers to um, a weakening of the bones. This is usually caused by not having enough calcium in the diet. The bones tend to weaken. And then, of course, um, we are at risk for fractures. Our most common group here is elderly women that get osteoporosis. Low back pain okay, is classified as an orthopedic disease. It's very, very common. For the most part, mo most low back pain can be treated with heat analgesics, which is things like um, ibuprofen, painkillers, Tylenol, aspirin, maybe muscle relaxers, some exercise and some movement. Uh, it's actually proven that sitting around is worse for your back pain than doing some exercise. They do make braces, um, traction, which we talked about in physical therapy, and surgery would be a last resort as about 80% actually um, fail and actually cause no relief for your patient. Some specialty allergy exams that you should be aware of um, can certainly help okay, to get some diagnosis. We can test for food allergies, seasonal allergies this way. And of course as an MA you can assist with and help perform the test and of course the patient education component is always part of your job. All right, the first is a scratch test, and these are done for specific allergies. This can be done on the arm, the back, and what they do is they take a small needle um, containing the object, so, you know, if it's corn, wheat, strawberries, whatever it is, and they just scratch the skin, and then they wait um, anywhere from five minutes to, to a couple of hours, and anywhere we see a large red, okay, widened patch, okay, is something that our patient is allergic to. If you essentially see nothing um, in that area that has been scratched, no redness, no swelling, no hives, then your patient is not allergic to that. The big key here is that if you're doing a scratch test, um, you should advise the patient, of course, that there might be some discomfort and, of course, some itching. And you should, you're often doing multiples of these at one time. So you can see on this patient's back, we've done quite a few scratch tests. You should keep a list of, you know, which scratch contain which object so that you can be certain um, when something does become positive of which um, item that you used for that scratch test. We have an intradermal test, and this is where we place a small amount, we take a needle, we place a small amount of an item just underneath the skin, kind of like a TB test, where you get that little bubble under the skin. This one is much more sensitive, so it's better at telling what somebody is allergic to, um, but clearly, we wouldn't want to have to inject because you can't use multiple needles. Um, you wouldn't want to have to inject a patient repeatedly. Um, so this is really done if a scratch test comes up positive and they just want to be more certain about a couple of allergies. And then a patch test is usually done for contact dermatitis. 
Um, this is just if something seems to irritate the skin. And essentially what they do here, um, and you can see this picture on the right-hand side, is they will take a piece of gauze and soak it in whatever allergen they think is causing the hive. They'll place that against the, the patient's skin. On top, they will stick a almost clear piece of what we call cellophane. It's almost like a plastic to seal in, and then they will tape that down. They will come back in anywhere from, again, five minutes to about an hour. And, of course, if you remove that, then you see hives for itching underneath the skin. Okay, the patient is allergic to that object that was placed against the skin. So that is called a patch test. RAST is actually a blood test. You would remove blood just like you would with a venipuncture. Um, and this one is sent off to the labs, and they would look at very particular things like antibodies and allergens. Um, I'm not going to get into those specific things in this class, but just realize that this test okay, requires full vials of blood to do, so it's much more complicated. We've talked cardiology, so I'm going to breeze through this. Um, auscultation, again, refer to listening. So the doctor will listen, you will listen to the blood pressure, the doctor will listen to the heart sound. They may palpate or touch the chest walls, some of the vessels, to see if they're too large. And of course, our ECG, which we spent a whole chapter discussing, so hopefully you know what that is by now. And again, we've talked about our stress tests. Okay, so again, please refer back to your previous chapter on stress tests. And our Holter monitor, remember, measured over a period of 24 hours, okay, the heart rate. Moving on to radiography, what we're talking about here is x-rays. Um, this is sort of a separate field, so you guys do not position or set up or take x-rays, but you can certainly uh, make sure that they are ordered um, and assist a patient with the x-ray technologist. Some common x-rays would be chest x-rays to look for pneumonias, lung problems, and cancers. And there are a couple of other studies that might be done by x-ray. Fluoroscopy, venograms look at veins, and angiography or angiograms look at arteries. Ultrasound, we've talked about a number of times, and this actually uses sound waves. Okay, and sound waves, when they bounce off objects inside the body, they can create a picture on a screen for us, so they use sound waves. And echocardiography is one that we've already talked about. So essentially what we're using are those sound waves, that ultrasound. And because we have the term cardio in here, we're talking about looking at the heart. They do have a heart MRI, and it should be noted that all MRIs, what they use is magnets. Okay, so they don't use any um, radioactive material, so this is relatively safe to do. But they use magnets and radio waves to bounce off the structures inside the body to create a computer image. Another thing you should be aware of is what we call cardiac catheterization. And a catheter is really just a tube. Um, and so what this does is they can actually feed it through, and they usually do this through the femoral artery, and they will feed it all the way up through the abdomen until it hits a part of the heart. Okay, and this catheter can do a couple of things. Okay, it can measure pressure inside the heart. You can look at the heart's motion, so it may have a camera attached. Um, some of these perform angioplasty, and angioplasty is what we jokingly like to call roto-rooter for the heart. So it will help to remove, take out okay, any um, plaque or fat that's built up against the heart wall. And you can use a catheter to insert what we call a stent. And a stent is a small metal piece. And so when somebody has damage um, to the heart wall and they have a blockage where they're not getting blood to the heart, what they do is they insert um, this piece okay, through the blockage. They open it up, and it helps to push open the blood vessel wall so that the fat is sort of smushed more towards the, the um, vessels of the wall, and it opens up a passageway for the blood. And a coronary artery bypass graft. This is often called a cabbage for short, so it sounds like a vegetable. It is not. Um, when one of your coronary arteries becomes totally blocked, what they can actually do is take some of the extra veins that you have in your leg and sort of root around the area um, that is a problem. So they will go in and they will find the blockage 
They'll start one part of the vein they've taken from your leg above that blockage, and they'll place one part below that blockage, essentially making an extra road or an extra pathway okay, for the blood to flow and then supply your heart. Just a couple of things about dermatology. When you work in dermatology, they do do whole body surface exams. Uh, this is really to detect uh, moles or cancers on the surface of the skin, so the doctor might document or look for those. We do have a special device we call a Woods light, and it's kind of like an ultraviolet light. I mean, if you put on, you know, like a UV light and you're in the dark, you know, certain colors pop up. And so essentially, if this is done against the skin, there are certain types of cancers and problems with the skin that when we darken the room and turn on this light, will almost, you know, shine um, like a black light will. For the endocrine, what they often do is they look at your skin condition, they'll take your weight and cardiac function, and they may palpate or touch the glands to see if they're actually enlarged. For endocrine, the easiest way for us to tell if there's a problem, so with diabetes or thyroid problems, is to just take a urine sample or to take a venipuncture and get blood in tubes to send it out to the lab and to get results back. For some of these organs, you can also do ultrasound, x-rays, or an iodine scan. That's when they inject iodine, which then shows up nice and bright on an x-ray. For gastroenterology, these tend to be a little bit more invasive because we often have to insert cameras in order to see the different body parts. So as a medical assistant, um, you should provide reassurance, ensure comfort, you're going to assist the doctor, and there are some patient instructions we're going to talk about in just a moment. So a common tool we use to look at the GI system is an endoscope, and you can see that pictured here. You put a camera to visualize down the body cavity. Uh, a pleural endoscope is used to look at the esophagus, the stomach, and the duodenum, which is the first part of the large intestine. A colonoscopy okay, is usually a camera inserted through the rectum, so they would examine the large intestine. Okay, this does require some patient education here. Patients do have to drink a special liquid to evacuate um, all of the bowel prior to coming in. And they often are put partially under, so they do need a ride home right after this procedure because they are often um, sedated a bit. A proctoscope, of course, is looking at the rectum and the anal canal, so this is a little bit lower, not quite as deep as the colonoscopy. And the sigmoidoscopy is actually deeper. The sigmoid area okay, is partway up that left-hand side um, of the patient's body, so it has to go up a good chunk of the large intestine. 